Happy to be here with my very special guest this week. You might recognize him as the voice of Hank McCoy, a.k.a. Beast, from the X-Men animated series, George Booza. George, how are you, sir? Great. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've been excited to to chat with you, you know, ever since we set up this interview, because not only am, am I a fan of the X-Men and of the original animated series, but as we're recording this, we're just a couple of days away from X-Men 97, the revival of the series. You know, it's I feel like we've been waiting on it for like the last couple of years, but it's finally here. So um, are, are you feeling the the excitement that, you know, now it's the masses are finally going to get to see it? Well, we just had a week of excitement because last Wednesday they previewed the show down in Los Angeles to a great success. And a number of the cast members were down there for that. I didn't make it because it's a little taxing to go for a 24-hour jaunt down to Los Angeles from Toronto. And then we had the uh, screening of the very first episode here at the Toronto Comic Con just the other day on Saturday morning. And Disney... Uh, took this suite at the con and decorated it uh, like the nineties with all the local, the uh, current posters from the nineties. They had a stack of Krispy Kreme donuts, little boxes of cereal. And uh, there were a whole group of us there from the X-Men and we had a little panel. Then we watched the first episode. So it was, a, it's been a very exciting week. And then, yeah, that... then on the 20th, we get the uh, full release. And what that's something I wanted to talk about, too, is that the marketing for the return of the show has been so good because you feel like everything from like the mock magazine cover to the trading cards and everything you just mentioned from the the Toronto Comic Con, it just adds that little extra layer of of excitement because, you know, this show has meant a lot to a lot of people. And I'm sure you've, you know, through appearing at conventions and maybe even as recently as the Toronto Comic-Con meeting fans who grew up you know, with that show, it, it does mean something important to them. Oh, it does. Every single show we do, we get people coming up to the table that uh, tell us how much the show meant to them and how it was their refuge from an otherwise unbearable existence in many cases. Well, and that's what's great, especially about the X-Men series specifically, is that you have all these different characters that have different abilities, whether it's, you know, someone who can shoot lasers out of their eyes or someone who's turned into a giant blue monster. Anybody who feels, you know, different than what we'd call normal society can relate to that, you know, whatever the case may be. And I, I think, you know, it, it it's provided a great escapism yes to to those that that might feel that way well i found a lot of refuge in comic books when i was a kid i used to read superman and i actually remember when x-men number one came out because that was when i was about 11 years old i'm dating myself here but uh comics cost a dime back then and uh I remember seeing it on the stand right next to my favorite uh, Superman comic book, and I picked it up, and I got it, and read it, and became an X-Men fan as well. So that when they when it came time to audition for the show, they were keeping it a big secret, so they called it Project X. Now, in my mind, you know, when you take the half of the title <laughs> and, and try to use it as an alias, <laughs> yeah. anyway, we being familiar with uh, the stories in that, when I was reading the sides to audition for this thing, I said, this isn't Project X, this is X-Men. You know, and my whole excitement level just went right through the roof because here I was auditioning for a character that uh, I'd identified with as a kid. So in what ways did you identify with, with Beast well, as a kid? I was different. Uh, in the 1950s, I was the child of uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe, refugees, actually. And uh, I didn't speak English until I was four. Uh, they were from Hungary. And uh, I was overweight. My parents dressed me very conservatively, like a nerd, sort of. So I took some bullying in school, and uh, I always felt a little bit different. And it's one of the reasons why I got into acting was because that was my refuge from the realities that I faced. I was able to assume different characters and... Uh, Instead of being laughed at, I was 
able to make people laugh by what I was doing on stage. So it kind of twisted the tables and I was more in control of what people could laugh at and what they couldn't. And that's a, an interesting point that, uh, you know, I'm glad you brought up because I, I normally start the show by asking, you know, cause I, I usually chat with actors, screenwriters, directors, and there's never really like a how to guidebook on how to get into whatever profession they decide oh, to follow. Well, there isn't, there isn't. People have written guidebooks like acting professionally, which is a book that I was given by the guy who was my mentor when I was an apprentice. And it gives you all the things that you have to do, like how to put together a resume, how to approach an audition, how to prepare for these things. But 99% of all the rest of it is blind luck. Being at the right place at the right time, you know, you, you can have all the talent in the world. But this is, again, something that was told to me, is that they pretty well know whether you're right for the role the minute you walk through the door. Because they already have a vision of what this character is going to look like and sound like in their minds. And it takes a real powerful audition to be able to change that view. So when you walk through the door and you meet all those criteria, you've already got yourself halfway through uh, the whole process. Now you've got to show them that you're capable of doing what they want you to do. But if you don't look the way that they imagined that the character would look, then uh, you've already got the cards stacked against you. No, and you're, you're absolutely right. Did your family support you whenever? Well, <laughs> I, was, I was threatened with being disowned and uh, oh, wow. bringing shame to the family. Because in Europe, uh, actors were bohemians, you know. They were, and especially the, uh, the view of what actors were like back in the, uh, the 30s and the 40s. Oh, even in Hollywood, you know, there was a there was a decadent society, really. And uh, I just knew that this is what I wanted to do the minute I stepped on stage my first play in high school. And they uh, really urged me to find something else. So I had to take an English major as well and tell them I was going to be a teacher. Meanwhile, I was loading myself up to the gills with uh, theater courses and, and taking every theater course that was available and sneaking in the odd English course. Yeah, I'm going to be an English teacher. <laughs> Auditioning for every play that they ever produced at the theaters. and It kind of became obvious that uh, I was going to be an actor. That the, uh, now, the mentioning teaching your theater was... background, did that help you in the transition to because i know you've done some live action acting as well and you know well, some i've done more live action. action than i have voice mm -hmm. i've done about a half a dozen tv series where i was a regular character on it and i've done a dozens and dozens of movies the uh the voice thing came later but it, theater is the best base for any actor because it gives you the uh the chops to be able to do just about anything. And most of the people that were the uh, voice actors on X-Men had a very deep theater background. Storm, Allison Seeley Smith, uh, she was at Stratford. I was at Stratford. Lenore Zan has a theater background. Virtually everybody in the cast started off in theater. And that is usually what the actors that come from a theater background, that's what they say is that it, it did help because you, you get the experience, you get the chops. And also what I respect the most about theater actors is that whenever you're doing a performance, you're essentially acting without a safety net. Oh, like yeah. if you, if you mess up, you almost have to make it part of the performance. <laughs> yeah. And it's happened to me. Uh, I was doing a, a production of curse of the werewolf, which is English panto. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's uh, what the Brits do at Christmas time. They, they do send ups of uh, famous stories. So we were doing Curse of the Werewolf. And this actually had a change from a, of a person changing into a werewolf on stage where we had all the male actors in the in the play were about the same size. So they had all these big pillars. And as one character would go behind the pillar, his body would emerge from the other side in the uh, guise of a different actor, but looking the same in a further stage of werewolf development until the very final actor, the, the one who was actually playing the part, came out in the full werewolf regalia, and it just blew the audience away. But anyway, the point of it being is that I had one of those moments where I had a three-page monologue, and I dried right in the middle of it. 
and I had no idea what, what came next. And the only actor that was on stage with me was Wendy Thatcher. And she had a gag in her mouth and she was tied to one of these darn pillars. And all she could do was... <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed like an eternity until I could finally find my lines again. So, yeah, it's uh, literally working without a net. Yeah, but I, I respect, you know, theater actors so much. And I, I respect, you know, obviously film and I like all actors because it's it's a talent that I don't have. And it's, you know, you're as great as writing can be. And I think that's where all stories start is with the script. But you still have to have the right people to bring yeah. those characters to life. Well, a bad actor can make a good script bad. Mm-hmm. And a bad script really can't be saved by a good actor. <laughs> yeah, true. No, you're absolutely right. So fast forwarding uh, to X-Men, the animated series, you get the role of Hank McCoy. Uh, how much freedom did you have in creating that voice for that character? Or did the creators have a specific... They wanted natural voices. So... They didn't want any cartooniness. They didn't want any squeaky, false voices. So all I tried to do with Beast was uh, make him sound very intelligent, very measured, very controlled, which is what he was. You know, he was the voice of reason amongst the X-Men. He was the counterpoint to Wolverine, who was ready to go. You know, the instant something went wrong, out came the claws and let's go get him. You know, and Beast would always hold back. No, no, let's see if we can try some reason. And then he would always come up with some sort of a quote before he laid waste. <laughs> he was basically a nerd who could kick butt. Yeah, exactly. And I think what's great about the Beast character is, and it really goes into the show as a whole with you. And I'm glad you brought up the point about natural voices and not sounding cartoony. Yes, it's an animated series, but there's some great voice acting and some great stories yes. in that show. Like you're, you, you feel like you're almost watching a drama that happens to have some fighting and some explosions. But well, if you really this is look a, at this is a case, a perfect example of the difference between cartoon and graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And I would say that X-Men falls more into that graphic novel category where we were telling stories that meant something, that had an arc, that had a message, rather than just uh, providing entertainment for kids on a Saturday morning. It went a lot deeper than that, and that was the aim of the show as well. We were dealing with uh, topics that were very current and very relevant at the time, and in today's society, I think those very same things are even more relevant than they were 30 years ago. I think that's now why now is the best time for that show to come back yeah. because, you know, I, I think of the issues that it touched on back then. And it, like you said, it can relate even more to, to 2024. So I'm, that's one of the reasons why I've been waiting for this show to come back because I'm really excited to see the stories that, that you guys tell. Well, episode one, this is all that I have seen of it so far, and it picks up right where we left off in 1997. So it's aptly named, and uh, I felt like I was watching the continuation of the last episode of the show. So it was really neat. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And I, I remember reading that that was going to be the case, and I thought that was, you know, a brilliant way to go because the show ended on a cliffhanger. Yeah. And that happened a lot back then, unfortunately, because you'd have shows that would get canceled, but you wouldn't get that resolution. And now, years later, we're going to get the continuation of it. So that is so rare in this business as well. I mean, now they're resurrecting a lot of the old series. You know, Frasier is back on the air, and they're talking about reunions of a lot of other sitcoms that were on. <clears throat> and, you know, it's just very, very unusual for somebody to be able to reprise a role that he played that many years ago. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. But I, I'm, I'm really excited for it. And I, I did want to ask you as we start to, to kind of wrap up this conversation to, to go back to the, the convention side of things and meeting fans. Um, I had the pleasure of um, interviewing Cal Dodd for the show uh, several months ago. And he told this story about 
this autistic gentleman and his daughter that you know they related so much to that show and it got them so emotional to meet the voice of Wolverine has there been any kind of you know story or incidents that have happened at conventions that you know meeting fans that have had an emotional impact on you absolutely every single show the very first time it happened was when this guy came to my table and uh, he was so overwhelmed tears were actually forming and in his cheeks and he had to go out into the hallway and compose himself before he could come back and have a conversation and it happens at every single show and a lot of people that uh, are so uh, invested in the show are on the spectrum i mean i have a grandson who's on the spectrum so i know exactly what they're dealing with because we deal with it on a daily basis and uh, it's really rewarding. I think that's the most rewarding part of doing those cons is to meet all those people who tell you how much the show meant to them. Because we never knew. We never knew how popular the show was, how successful it was. They told us uh, when we did our very first con and Julia and Eric Leewald gathered us together in uh, New Brownfields, Texas told us that uh, the studio's hallways were filled. You know, those giant carts on wheels that they push mail in. They were filled to the brim, lining the entire hallway, filled with fan mail. We never knew about that. They kept us on the hook absolutely every year. Do we get renewed? Do we get canceled? Are we coming back? Do we still have jobs? There was no, oh, they ne never told us the show was an enormous success and we've got mail for days down the hallway. Nah, they don't tell you that. <laughs> That's crazy because, and you also didn't have the internet or social media back nope. then. So you couldn't go on Twitter or Facebook and no. read what people are thinking. No, you, if there was any kind of a review, it would appear in the newspaper we even, every recording that we did in Toronto got sent down to Los Angeles on uh, cassette tape. <laughs> there was That's no wild. Zoom. The studio had to have the uh, director on site. The producers from Saban and Marvel were there on site in the recording booth. There was none of this uh, remote stuff. I mean, now we walk into the studio, which is, by the way, the same studio we recorded the original series in. Oh, that's awesome. So it was really a deja vu walking into that place and into this very same studio, not just the same building, but the same little cubicle that we recorded the entire series in was where we did the first recordings and still are doing the recordings now. And the, That's pretty the, incredible because, you know, with the invention of zoom and, you know, the advancement of technology, a lot of people can have their own studio at home yeah. and just record the lines there. But th there's something about going in an actual studio and it has a different feel to it than just standing in a little booth and you know, like your office or somewhere in your house. Yeah. Well, this is where I am now. You know, this is where I've been doing voiceover stuff for a long time, ever since the pandemic started. And it really kind of took away one part of the business that all of us used to look forward to, which were the voice auditions. Because unlike the uh, on-camera auditions where they would invite about a half a dozen people for each role to audition, when you're doing a voiceover, it goes on for days. And so you run into about 20 or 30 people at the studio where you're auditioning that you hadn't seen in a while. And it turns into a social event. And especially when you're in the uh, seniors category, you see all these old people that don't come out very often and you haven't seen in a long time. And then you go out for coffee and it's almost like hanging out at the mall. <laughs> you, see, you run into each other at the auditions and you go out and you forget about the audition. You just look forward to seeing people again. That's great. And it especially means even more, you know, after the extended period we'd had of being in quarantine and lockdown with the pandemic. Yeah, except it they haven't makes... gone back to it. That's gone now. Everything you do now is self-tape. So that's why I've got to have a studio where I can do some recording and I've got to buy a microphone. And I got headphones, but they bug me. Yeah, headphones are tricky. Like, you know, it, it, I'm really picky about mine. So I, I totally feel you on that. Well, the only reason I would ever get them is if I had to do any recording here. But all I do are the auditions and it's not that important for me now. Right. 
I um, enjoy doing the cons the most. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it is, it's great, you know, for uh, us fans too, because yeah, you had San Diego comic-con and I remember reading about that, you know, in the early days of the internet, but you know, we didn't have, you know, conventions that were just like a short drive away or, you know, a couple well, of hours away. The size of them now is just so amazing. Mm -hmm. I was down at Megacon in Orlando and they had 160,000 people. Wow. Over four days. That's I mean, incredible. That's, it is. All in one place. Yeah, that's... I, that blows my mind. Like I knew, I know that's a highly attended con, but I had no idea there were that many people there. That was the tally. That's insane. It is. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely insane. So, um, what's next for you? And uh, we've got the um, the premiere of X Men ninety seven coming up this week. By the time the viewers and listeners see this, the first episode will already be out. But do you have any other? Um, you have voiceover projects in the works. Yeah, that, I'm that doing another about? cartoon series where I play a, a grandfather rabbit on Eleanor Wonders Why. And uh, that's been on for a while now. And I did the role earlier. Again, this is one thing that uh, kind of went into hiatus during the pandemic, and now they brought it back. And so they brought back the grandfather rabbit, which was kind of nice. So I've got a semi-recurring role on that. And then I had a, re a, a role on... Uh, my little pony. So I'm still keeping active with what's left with, uh, of, uh, animation. You know, so much of it now is, is kids. You know, they've taken over the whole animation world. So there's very little left for old guys, unless there's a grandpa in there. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily you've got a reoccurring role. So yeah, yeah. There, so there I'm go. happy with that. And I still do auditions for commercials and other projects that come along. Yeah, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, do you have a website or social media? No, that you no, want to I'm, plug? A I'm not a nerd like that. <laughs> I, I'm not on any social media, and uh, I don't take pictures of what I ate for lunch and post it online. And <laughs> I leave that all to the kids. Yeah, you know, when we had uh, the cons coming up and everything, they wanted us to publicize it. I tell the kids, tell them Grandpa's going to such and such a place. <laughs> you probably will get more followers than I will. <laughs> uh, I love that though. It, it's social media can be great, but at, at other times it can be. Well, I can see how terrible. many problems it causes. Cause I've got 11 grandchildren and oh, wow. there's not a single one of them that hasn't had some sort of an issue as a result of uh, social media. I believe it. it's, uh, it's, it's a jungle. It really is. It, it it can be great, like I said, in it for certain purposes. But like anything, if you if you use it for good, it's great. If you use it for bad, then it's yeah. pretty terrible. But no, uh, George, thank you so much for for taking the time to have this chat with me, and look forward to X Men ninety seven finally premiering. Yeah, I hope you enjoy the show as much as we did, and thanks very much for having me on. <laughs> 